Reading through the Bible in one year, October 1st, 1 Kings 8, 1 through 21, 1 Corinthians 5 through 6, Ezekiel 22, 1 through 12, and Psalms 111 through 113. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the, the leaders of the fathers' houses of the people of Israel, before King Solomon in Jerusalem, to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim, which is in the seventh month. Ooh. Excuse me. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. And they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent, the priests and the Levites before them, or brought them up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priests brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house, in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the ark, so that the uh, cherubim overshadowed the ark and its poles. And the poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary, but could not be seen from the outside. And they are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark uh, except the two tablets of stone that Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And when the uh, priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have indeed built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell for, to dwell in forever. Then the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel. All the well, all the assembly of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to David my father, saying, Since the day that I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house, that my name might be there. But I chose David to be over my people Israel. Now, it was in the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to David, my father, whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son who shall be born to you shall build the house for my name. Now the Lord has fulfilled his promise that that he has made. For I have risen in the place of David, my father, and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised, and have built for him or built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. And there I have provided a place for the ark, in which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Now 1 Corinthians 5-6. through six. <gasps> Excuse me. No. Man. All right. So now uh, Paul is going to uh, continue this um, letter of correction for the people of Israel. Um, I feel for this church. I do. Um, they're doing their best, but they're also trying to please the people around them. And this is the kind of thing that happens. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not even tolerated among pagans. For a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present, With the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, 
so that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. You know that even a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you are really unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swindlers, or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, so someone who says that they're a Christian, if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such one. Now, if the person is repentant, then obviously they belong to the family of God. You bring them back in. You help them get back to their place. If it's a pastor, he may not be. It, it depends on the role within the church, but he will probably not be a lead pastor ever again if he was a lead pastor when he started on this path. Um, there's just too much at stake. But he might be um, restored simply as a um, as a lay elder, but certainly not for a while. Here we go. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. This is obviously somebody who's repent sorry, who's unrepentant. Someone who doesn't want to go away from their sin, someone who has been confronted by the church and is like, nah, it's just the way I am. This is my Christian liberty. I'm allowed to do this. And he just keep doing it. No, you separate from that person. And the point of that separation, as is shown above, um, you're to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. You're turning him over so that he will be... um, Let me just read the note on it because it's faster for me to do that than to come up with something. So in the ESV study Bible, it says... This probably refers to removing him from the church, since those outside the church are in Satan's realm. The destruction of the flesh, although it's not, sorry, although it's not, although it is certainly not always the case, um, personal sin sometimes um, has grave physical consequences, and the spirit may be saved. The purpose of the discipline was not to punish the man for punishment's sake but to affect his restoration to the church and eventual salvation. If he's unrepentant, let him know that he is not welcome in the body of Christ. We have enough troubles. We have enough struggles. We have enough things that we're currently going through. If somebody is unrepentant in sin, they don't belong to the body of Christ. Set him outside. If at some point down the road they repent and they come back and they apologize and they're like, can I please be back within the group? Then absolutely. But they cannot continue the same path of sin that they were in before. But he goes on. When one of you has a grievance against another, against another Christian, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more, then, matters pertaining to this life? So if you have have cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? Why go to uh, to a magistrate, to a judge, to anybody else outside of the body of Christ to judge a problem inside the body of Christ. I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, 
and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud, even your own brothers. This is just a, a, a dwelling, sorry, an indwelling of pride within these people. They aren't willing to accept the fact that, yeah, they might end up suffering wrong, right? Somebody stole from them. So then they go to court after those people. Why not just let them take it? Let it go. God is the one who's going to judge, not us. If by showing mercy, you can show the mercy of Christ to somebody, do it. Let it go. For as much as it's within your ability to do so, do that. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be, uh, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor, al- nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Again, were, past tense, this is who you used to be. You are now no longer these people. But you were washed. You were sanctified. Sanctified means to be set apart for a holy purpose. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now he's responding to them with their own questions. They sent a note to him, a letter to him, and he's responding to them. So that's why you can see right here that it's in quotes. Right? All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. That's a common saying, right? Well, if the stomach is meant for food, then we should fill it with food, right? The other part of this, the other half of that slogan, uh, oh, it's actually noted here. Another Corinthian slogan uh, may assume a parallel between hunger for food and the sexual drive as a pretext for justifying any form of sexual indulgence. We have sexual members. That's what they're meant for. That's their use. You have to go use them for that, right? No. Because as the line is, the you know food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. We are not primarily sexual beings. That being beings that were created for the purpose of sex. We are spiritual beings that are created to worship God. And whether or not we choose to accept that and choose to pursue that is completely irrelevant to the fact that that is our original created purpose. That's it. So we should, by all means, pursue those things. Remember first your purpose on this earth. It's not to gratify yourself or your own desires. It's to serve God. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the bot sorry in the Lord for the body. And God raised the um the Lord, lowercase L O R D, this means Jesus the Christ, and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that our that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute, yes, literally in that way, becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. 
So glorify God in your body. Don't glorify yourself. Don't pursue your own desires. Don't pursue any of these other things. Seek the glory of God in all things. All right, let's go to Ezekiel 22. There we go. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, And you, son of man, will you judge? Will you judge the bloody city? Then then declare to her all her abominations. You shall say, Thus says the Lord God, a city that sheds blood in her midst, so that her time may come, and that makes idols to defile herself. You become guilty by the blood that you have shed, and defiled by the idols that you have made. And you have brought your days near. The appointed time of your years has come. Therefore, I have made you a reproach to the nations and a mockery to all the countries. Those who are near and those who are far from you will mock you. Your name is defiled. You are full of tumult. Behold, the princes of Israel in you, every one according to his power, have been bent on shedding blood. Father and mother are treated with contempt in you. The sojourner suffers suffers extortion in your midst. The fatherless and the widow are wronged in you. You have despised my holy things and profaned my Sabbaths. There are men in you who slander to shed blood and people in you who eat on the mountains. Again, eating on the mountains, having a picnic, that's not the point that's being made. Uh, The eating on the mountains is part of a pagan sacrifice. They commit lewdness in your midst. And you men uncover their father's nakedness. In you they violate women who are unclean in their menstrual impurity. One commits abomination with his neighbor's wife. Another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law. Another in you violates his sister, his uh, father's daughter. In you they take bribes to shed blood. You take interest and profit and make gain of your neighbors by extortion. But me? Me you have forgotten, declares the Lord God. Now Psalm 111 through 113. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the inheritance of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. One twelve. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals graciously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his enemies or on his adversaries. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. Now Psalm 113. Praise the Lord. 
Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord, our God, who is seated on high, who looks uh, far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the, um, the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and with princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Behold the word of the Lord.